I'm the Inbound Marketing Manager at Log My Calls, and we're excited you're here today. We're also really excited that we have Sean Butler, the Director of Social Media at LeadGenix with us as well. Um, it is Wednesday, February 26th at 2 p.m. Eastern, so we're going to get started with our webinar. First, a couple of house cleaning items before we turn it over to Sean. Um, first and foremost, know that this webinar is being recorded, so you'll have access to it. We'll send it to you via email tomorrow morning, bright and early. We encourage you to share it within your organization as well as share it on social media and online. Uh, please do that. It'll help build the uh, awareness of this webinar series. Um, to give you some background on who we are and what this webinar series is, so uh, the page that uh, Sean has chosen as his first slide is actually our webinar library, logmycalls.com slash webinar, logmycalls.com slash webinar. If you go there, you're going to see literally almost 100 webinar recordings. So we have upcoming webinars that you can register for, but then also recorded webinars that you can watch uh, at, for, without filling out a form. So you just simply click play on the little video and you can watch the webinars. We've had guests like Tim Ash, who's the CEO of Site Tuners and the CEO of Conversion Conference. We've had the CEO of Unbound. We've had the, we've had the executives from Yext and Ballyhoo. So really good companies, really expert marketers from across the country, across North America. So we encourage you to go to logmycalls.com slash webinar to watch those webinars. Now the, the, the next thing to point out is, is people wonder, well, why do you do these webinars? Who is Log My Calls? Log My Calls is a call tracking and call analytics tool. So basically what we do is we tell marketers which ads, campaigns, and keywords generate phone calls. And then more importantly perhaps is we actually analyze the content of the calls, the conversation itself, to determine what happened on the phone call. So we can tell you if there was an appointment booked or if there was a sale made or if there was a missed opportunity uh, based on the words and phrases said on the phone call. So it's a powerful tool and our audience is marketers and so we thought what better way to A, attract our audience but also provide really useful content than to do really good marketing webinars. And so that's what we do. So we have these webinars once or twice a week, and we're excited that Sean has agreed to join us today. So as you can see on Sean's page there, he's worked with some of the top agencies and top brands in both uh, Georgia and Utah. He is right now the director of social at LeadGenix. They're based in northern Utah. Um, we log my calls, have offices in northern Utah, as well as our headquarters in southern Utah. So we're excited that Sean's agreed to join us today. He was showing, trying to test a few things with his presentation a moment ago. It looks awesome, so I'm excited for it. Sean, thanks for joining us, sir. Of course. No, I'm glad to uh, have been invited and to join the illustrious group of presenters for Log My Calls. <laughs> illustrious indeed. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> um, sure, let's jump in. I've created a first slide because I always like to know um, who, who's talking to me. So you may be wondering that yourself, if that's the case. Here's a nice logo cloud aimed at impressing you with some big names, uh, some of the cooler stuff that I've done. Um, yeah, if you're not easily impressed, I'll have to ask you to bear with me, as I have about another 40 minutes or so that I'll present something that I expect will make your time on the, on the webinar feel worthwhile today. So let me get started by giving a little scientific taste on you. I'm sure um, some of you are asking this question. Marketing using the seventh legal addiction. Why am I attending a webinar about this? Well, I'll tell it to you right up front. This webinar is really designed for people who would like to have customers showing up to their sites that are 300% more likely to recommend their brand, 44% less likely to shop around to competitors, and 33% less sensitive when it comes to your pricing. Now, those are great points. I'll come back to this and give you the quote, as well as the mysterious um, name behind the quote for these statistics that I'm showing you at the end, but that's a little bit to whet your appetite. And I'm sure some of you will be impressed um, by my use of big words from important looking books. So I'm going to start out with a definition of addiction. Addiction is a compulsion to consume a habit forming substance despite problems related to its use. It's often characterized by impairment in behavioral control, inability to consistently abstain, and a diminished recognition of problems with behavior and relationships. Most of you already know this definition. You've got it on hand in your handy dandy diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders. Um, but I, I want to hit you with those big words because as you listen to this definition, um, I'm sure many things come to mind that would fall into this description. I'm laughing because most of them are probably illegal in this country. 
Um, and this is a good moment when you're probably looking back at the description for this uh, webinar, the title saying, uh, this isn't about illegal substances, um, this is marketing using illegal substances is pretty much frowned on. I think we can all agree on that. So I want to point out that there are legal substances that we know serve this definition of addiction. Let's visit these. These are products some of us know um, very well. Um, number one is alcohol. Number two is nicotine. Number three, these are according to the FDA, the six legally addictive substances in the United States, caffeine in its various forms. Uh, number four is prescription medications and aspirin. Number five is sugar. This is one that surprises a lot of people. Um, highly addictive. And number six, recently added to the list um, by several states, is, is marijuana in its various forms. Now that may seem like a fairly random list of substances to find classified together. They're items that you drink, you to eat, uh, some that you have to set fire to and inhale. Um, but they are really have one thing in common. So to discover this common trait, let's go back to our leather-bound book that smells of, of rich mahogany, and I'll read you the definition out loud for your benefit of addiction. Addictive substances work by changing one's brain chemistry, flooding the brain's reward circuit with dopamine. That's a chemical that regulates pleasure, attention, cognition, other things in, inside of your brain. So the commonality between all of these substances is you're really not a substance addiction, but a chemical addiction to the human-produced uh, chemical dopamine, which is related to alpha waves and endorphins being released into your brain. Um, if any of you are clinical psychologists or med students, you'd probably correct my definition a little bit, but for a functional definition, we'll just move forward with that. Dopamine affects your brain. This is your brain on dopamine. Uh, this is why these substances have such an addictive effect. They're stimulating the brain to feel a, a reward sense that is creating pleasure, um, and our bodies have, through evolution, been designed as a survival tactic, really, to seek out ways, stimulation of these reward circuits um, in, in our own brains. What's interesting is scientists right now are working in a different field, closely related to this chemical addiction, which is called behavioral addiction, where you see things like compulsive shopping, problem gambling, overeating, even overworking, and recently watching YouTube videos. So this strikes me as an interesting thing, that with certain types of consumption of social media, you're activating the same parts of the brain involved in pleasure sensors, just as though you were receiving a dose of heroin, um, or engaged in sexual activity to use other stim brain stimulating aspects of your mind. Um, with social media, we are truly selling the seventh legal addiction. Right now, um, we're going to talk a little bit about why social media is so addictive. We'll give you some definitions. And then I'm going to move over to talk about how you can use this as a marketing um, professional at a branding level to turn your company into something that's both legal as well as addictive. So let's define what makes social media uh, ad addictive by jumping back in time. Um, in, the, in the 60s, there was a renowned scientist, B.F. Skinner, who was famous for testing things on rats. That's what he did. But one of the theories he came up with was called intermittent variable reward. IVR is defined as a method of behavioral reinforcement conditioned by rewarding action intermittently as opposed to consistently. What this boiled down to is he would put rats in cages, as he was prone to do, and when the rats would push a lever on the food magazine, they would receive a pellet. And the rats would fall into a behavior of clicking, pushing the lever, and receiving a pellet. And when they were hungry, they pushed the lever, whatever. Well, so he introduced this, the theory of intermittent variable reward, which meant that sometimes when they pushed the lever, they would get three pellets or five pellets. Sometimes when they pushed the lever, they got nothing. This caused the rats to push the lever at the expense of all other rat behaviors, literally pushing the button until they had died. 
right now this behavior is happening all over the world in the form of people refreshing their email boxes, their Facebook, their Twitter to see if they've been liked, friended, contacted, invited to an event. It's happening millions of times, uh, for those of you who recognize this logo, in the last couple of weeks with an online app called Flappy Bird. It was rated as so addictive that the user pulled it off of the iTunes and Google's um, app stores because he felt it was a dangerous product and it was causing um, causing problems and creating hate mail um, for the for the developer. So what can we learn from this? What is the factor inside of intermittent variable reward and the behavioral psychology behind social media that's creating this addictive behavior? And of course, I'm going to lead to how can we use this knowledge to work for us? Uh, number one, we know that interaction activates the reward area of the brain. Um, from Dr. Michael Bengston, a professor and child and adolescent psychiatrist, says, just as gamblers get a rush of good feelings when they win, a social media junkie feels gratification when their Facebook post gets a lot of likes, when their Twitter followers multiply, and when their Instagram photos are, are, are big hits. This compels people to participate more in this behavior, again, to activate that reward circuit or that dopamine release in their brains. So we know that interaction with a brand has its own rewards. We also know um, from a recent study at Harvard that disclosing personal information um, about yourself activates that same part of the brain that's associated with the sensations of pleasure that you get from food, getting money, or even having sex. This is a Harvard study, and this is very recent information um, that they're, they're putting together to say, you know what, there's more to this than we really like Facebook. There's more to it than when I have free time, I'm going to forward an email or tweet to my friends. It actually has these behavioral um, mechanics built into it, which create their own reward circuits and stimulate that behavior for us. So knowing that, we want to take some of the components of addictive drugs, substances, and, and how they work on the brain and turn those around and use them to make our brands effective. Let me distill this down to a few points that we'll go through one by one. Um, but first was put the customer at the forefront of everything. How many of you know what Zappos is famous for? Contrary to popular belief, they are not the first company to sell shoes online. And that's not where they built their reputation at all. Uh, you can see the key takeaways here is they're touting this return policy. They really put customer service as their caveat. And it's created a, a culture of people who love Zappos. They're very passionate about them. In fact, on the scale of uh, companies where there exists brand addiction, Zappos ranks in the top five. Let's look at a case study real quickly of, of Zappos and how they've managed to connect with their customers at this level. First of all, they have a policy that the customer is always right, reading from left to right on the blackboard here. Um, on top of that, they offer a 365-day return policy, no questions asked. That reinforces that the customer is always right, but more than that, you're making your customer feel like they're a, a privileged member of your community. It's that VIP experience that really creates a customer loyalty track. Um, on top of that, they give out surprise gifts, such as free next day air shipping. For those of you who shop Zappos, you don't know when these gifts are going to happen. There's certain things they'll drop into the package with you. There's certain offers they'll run for as, as little as 60 minutes at a time. And that's really playing to that psychological factor of intermittent variable reward that it encourages a customer to come back to that site to look for more information, to look for those windows of opportunity when they'll be rewarded for their loyalty and for their persistent visitation to that website. Um, finally, they deliver happiness by focusing more on the experience than the product. This is a key thing that you see in, in plenty of different businesses um, where they want unwrapping your computer or your, your, new tech, your new device or your clothes that you've ordered to be an experience in and of itself. That's packaging, that's boxes, that's messaging, that's even um, going so far as to request that their clients videotape what it's like to unwrap an Aperion um, audio speaker because that experience in itself is part of the prod product that you're purchasing. Zappos does this extremely well. Um, we'll look at a couple of other examples of companies that fall again on that list of the most addictive brands. 
The second uh, method we want to talk about is to create opportunities for customers to interact with you. According to the Fogg Behavioral Model, which is developed by uh, B.J. Fogg, a professor at Stanford University, the idea is to find a moment where you coincide a trigger with a high point of motivation and making a process easy to do. Uh, to put this in a very simple format, it's what Professor Fogg calls creating tiny habits. That if each day you say, I'm going to work out today or I'm going to go running, most of the time we fail <laughs> because at the high moments of motivation, uh, we find that there's a, a big hurdle to overcome. We have to get ourselves off, off the couch, we have to put on our running shoes, and we have to take the additional steps to put ourselves in a position to go and do what we already know is healthy and beneficial to us. So he'll create tiny habits. His recommendation boils down to things like put on your running shoes each day when you come home from work. If you already have your running shoes on, then there's one less hurdle for you to, hit, to have to overcome when you hit a moment of motivation. And putting on your running shoes each day is a very easy to do um, practice that, again, is taking away those barriers for act activation. Facebook does this for us in a very elegant way. Um, Facebook is on that list of the most addictive brands. People who love Facebook feel very loyal to it. Usership on Facebook um, reports that 50% of its members are logging into it every day, and the average user spends five to seven hours on Facebook in a typical week. That's not the heavy users who are on it 25 to 30 hours, which is like a full-time job. Here's why Facebook works. One of the key things they do is they engage you right away. They invite you to talk to them. Uh, the opening prompt when you log in is, what's on your mind? The answer to that question is a simple tiny habit that gets you into the mode of understanding how the tool works, how you're supposed to interact with Facebook, and a nice entry point for what comes next. Um, you can take that to the next level with contests. We highly recommend building these contests, and Facebook has made it so much easier to run contests on their native platform. A simple contest that tie back to your brand can have a very strong um, you know, impact, I guess, with your customer because it tells them, again, how to interact with your page. It makes it a very easy step for them to say, what am I supposed to do when I get to this point? You can see for this example I'll talk through very quickly is for, is for a restaurant that really prides itself on having unusual pizza pies. Um, the contest we ran was playing up that feature that was already part of their unique selling proposition. The contest simply said submit an original delicious pizza idea in the comments below, get your friends to like it, and the one with the most likes uh, will win. And the reward was that they would create your pizza, invite you in and have you and your friends order it, or get it for free, rather, and then they would add it to the menu and serve it for the rest of that month. Well, this attracted a certain type of crowd that was happy to engage with the brand and was happy to also flex some of their culinary muscles and invent some pretty unusual pizzas. Um, you can see one here in this recommendation was a spicy barbecue sauce, barbecue pulled pork, goat cheese, and a little mozzarella, grilled onions and garlic, arugula. It, Sounds unusual, um, but again, it was a way for people to know what they needed to do to engage with the page, how to participate in the contest, and there's nothing mind-blowing here. Again, you're not going to see rocket surgery in a contest like this. You want to keep it very simple, very straightforward to say, here's how we want you to play this game, here's the reward for it, and it's a clear, easy barrier to entry for participants to start to engage more with your brand. Um, what's key is you'll notice the flying pie jumps on and keeps talking back to the participants in the contest. This ties back to that first objective, which is to help them feel like they're part of your brand, to feel a personal level of engagement. By talking back to people, you're hitting what the Harvard study says. They're getting to share personal information about themselves, and they're feeling acknowledged and listened to, which is a key part of that risk-reward cycle, which is stimulating their brains and, again, triggering those addictive behaviors. A lot of people don't want to post these types of things on their walls, and I feel like the biggest fear they have is once we allow people to come and talk to us on Facebook, they're going to give us negative press. <laughs> they're going to post something that we really don't want to handle. Well, reputation management should be a key part of your social media strategy. I'll show you one example from a world that is easy to um, 
to despise. <laughs> this is coming from a car dealership client. And for those of you who, who know the reputation for car dealerships, um, you can tell this is a magnet for this type of negative social media posting. I'll read this post out loud and, and reveal the twist ending and why we think this is such an effective way to let people get involved with your brand using your social media sites. Uh, this girl, Caitlin Marmon, who's given me permission to share this, <laughs> says that you guys were hands down the worst place I've ever bought a car. I had a sales representative include three free services when I bought the car, then no paperwork was filed. It goes on from there, and you can see if you hit see more, there's actually an additional paragraph or two of this girl explaining why this particular dealership is the worst place. Um, she, she goes right to the superlative in all of this, explaining you're the worst, most awful thing, even in the world of dealerships, which is pretty, pretty condemning praise. Um, well, we jump on and we handle this. We handle this in a typical PR fashion. You say, Caitlin, please call us as soon as you can. And you give them a name and a phone number, and you immediately want to take this conversation offline. This hits on those points we talked about. This customer spoke to you initially because she felt like she wasn't being heard. She was looking for a customer service angle that she could reach out through in, in order to get a response. Well, it, through this service, within a few hours, now Caitlin is hearing that her her concerns have been understood and there's a route now. There's a method for her to have this concern resolved. And, and that's exactly what we put here. We would like very much to help resolve this issue. Now this is airing your dirty laundry in the, in the worst way possible. All of the fans on a Facebook page are seeing this post and the dealership's response to this post. But look where this can go. Caitlin jumps back on and says, thank you so much for being so helpful. You and your office lady, Jessica, were the nicest people I've talked to. Thanks for helping me get this taken care of, and I will be stopping by today to get my oil changed. Can you talk about a 180 reversal? She goes from saying you're the worst dealership I've ever experienced to saying you're the nicest people I've ever talked to. So again, she deals very heavily in, in <laughs> extremes, but that's quite normal behavior when we read it on social media. Well, our policy is to never let the customer have the last word. So, of course, we jump back on and say, thanks, Caitlin. We're glad we could help. Please let us know if you need anything else. We appreciate your business. Now, let me state the obvious and point out again, this conversation is happening in real time in a publicly visible space. All of your Facebook fans can see this happening because it's posted to your company's wall. But also, all of Caitlin's connections are seeing aspects of this conversation. So what you're doing effectively is customer service in the most public forum possible which is turning into a customer endorsement by her response post. People talk to us all the time about their fear of addressing customers and really opening up conversations on social media. And I hold this up as just one of the many examples we see of the benefits of allowing customers to talk to you, to engage with your brand. And you know, in line with the, the theme of this presentation, I'll point out, Caitlin said at the end, I will be stopping by today to get my oil changed. She feels like a valuable customer who's really being communicated with, and her answers to this are meeting her emotional and psychological requirements that are creating that reward cycle inside of, inside of her own brain. We're feeding that addiction. On the other hand, when a customer reaches out to a company on any platform, social media, telephone, website, and they don't get an answer back, you're still creating a Pavlovian response. You're still creating a psychological impact on that customer, but it's, it's the worst one possible. It's the customer feeling like they don't matter. My business isn't important and this company doesn't care. Which is my segue <laughs> into my third, uh, the third point we want to make, which is let them invest in your brand since they own it. Um, an advisor to GoPro, Robert May, says the big change that has been brought about by social media is that the brand is no longer the property of just its owners. It now belongs to the company's customers and the audience as well. Uh, we've seen some very dramatic examples of this. Um, if you've read the story of Timberland Boots, it was originally made for timber workers. It was manufactured in the Midwest to be a waterproof boot for the people who needed a waterproof boot to go and work in the lumber industry. And that was who they felt was their target audience, and that was what the ownership of that company was building. Um, many of you know that the story goes this way, that it was actually picked up by urban and rural, inter or, um, sorry, urban and inner city teens who spent a lot of time walking on wet streets and um, was actually highly adopted by the drug trade <laughs> and became a, a very symbolic aspect of the uniform of inner city and urban teens. So 
Timberland completely lost control of its brand, and they are a great case study in the fact that they embraced who, who their audience was and started to make customized products that really met that need. And the rest is history when you see you know, the, the stock growth and the um, product extensions that have come out for Timberland since that big change about 10 years ago. In review, the ways to make your brand into an addictive culture is by putting the customer at the forefront of everything. You want to create opportunities for that customer to feel like they're part of your brand. When you start seeing customers putting your own brand and your logo and repeating the conversations they've had with your social media presence on their own websites, on t-shirts that they wear, on posters that they're sharing on Pinterest, then you've created a different connection that goes beyond your providing a product or service that they're happy to buy. Finally, let them invest in your brand since they truly are the ones who are going to own it and operate as advocates. Uh, we talk all the time here that change, a big change that's come into the industry is word of mouth referral. And the, the, the traditional experts, like nine out of 10 dentists, or even Oprah Winfrey recommending a book to her book club each month has a lot less credibility when there's a powerful brand or an individual blogger who has thousands of unique impressions that they're capable of getting each month and can recommend instead a product to wear, a service to provide, or as we showed before, handle a customer service issue in a very public forum on their social media page that turns out to answer a lot of questions for other customers and leads to great word of mouth, incredible brand reputation management that honestly can't be purchased through any traditional marketing means. So let's go through a case study. Um, a famous example of a brand that has an addictive um, audience base is Old Spice. And I'm going to play this video just so you can remember how customer-centered their, their um, advertising campaign was. Um, this is a few years back, but the real takeaway that Old Spice had was they needed to sell deodorant for men through women. <laughs> so they wanted to sell a man's product, but they knew that the key decision maker or the influencer in a lot of that product purchase was women. So they took on this, this unique challenge by creating advertising that spoke both to women and to men in a way that was appealing um, to, to both genders to drive them towards product purchase. They did it in a way that was very real time and very aware of who their customer was and how their customers spoke. Let me play this video and tell me if it's coming through loud and clear. Hello ladies, how are you? Fantastic. Does your man look like me? No. Can you smell like me? Yes. Should he use Old Spice body wash? I don't know. Do you like the smell of adventure? Do you want a man who smells like he can bake you a gourmet cake in the dream kitchen he built you with his own hands? Of course not. Swan dive into the best night of your life. So ladies, should your man smell like an Old Spice man? You tell me. Again, it appealed to both sides of their audience with a unique voice and strong branding, strong imaging that really separated customers. Uh, it's a common cliche that if you're targeting everyone, you're targeting no one. But the inverse of that is that if you're really targeting an audience, you're going to alienate a good portion of your audience. And our advice is that's okay. You want to find the 80-20 you know, rule says there's a 20% people out there who are going to be the ones who contribute the majority of your revenue, the majority of your loyalty, drive the majority of your referral customers, and that's who we're really going after. To my second point, watch how interactive this campaign became. Um, you may remember, if you don't, I'll talk through it, but they grabbed the old Spice guy and they put him in a studio and they had him answer real time to tweets and Facebook posts using video clips and posting them on YouTube directed at certain high-profile individuals um, like Kevin Rose, who's the inventor of, of Dig, I think is his claim to fame. There's a guy on there named Apollo Ono who you know, gets to talk on TV every couple of years. GQ is addressed on here. Um, but then there's some, there's some nobodies. I mean, they're just some regular people who they also reached out and spoke to in answer to their questions. Uh, this one I'm going to play is he reached out to a fairly indivi uh, influential individual named Ellen and <laughs> talked directly to her. Hope you're doing fantastic. I realize that my unbelievably rippling abs can be distracting. So 
I grew this goatee that encircled my mouth so people pay attention to the words that come out, just for you. And those words are, thank you for that, for massaging my ears with your compliment-laden Twitter prose. Things have been going great for me. In Eastern Latvia, they love Old Spice Body Wash so much, they made me king, which is great because I love grapes. And I've renamed my kingdom Elenopia, where you've been crowned Grand Princess Queen of all who are pleasant, syndicated, and prone to spontaneous dance movements. Thank you, Grand Princess Queen Ellen. Thank you. So on the addictive psychology side of this, what we look at is he's reached out and talked to Ellen Generous, who is a powerful influencer, and he may have won loyalty from her. She would feel a personal connection to the old Spice Guy from receiving a video like this tweeted back to her. Uh, and in fact, it worked. He, um, he appeared, she invited him, and he appeared on the Ellen Show um, the next week. And at some point, she got him to remove his shirt, and it made for great television. Um, but the key additional part of that that I want to point out is all of the fans of Ellen now feel like they're in on this community. They feel like Old Spice is talking to them, that it gets who they are, and it's allowing an opportunity for them to interact with the brand. Now, this case study goes one step further. Hello, friends. Oh, like all great things. This is the closing this too must end. There's giant hopes that need chainsawing into yacht boats. Bermuda Triangle mysteries that need solving with huge magnet button glasses. And everyone knows I could use one or twelve medals for winning exotic car throwing competitions. I must ride my jet ski lion into the sunset. I know a lot of you have written me and commented on my works, but I am just one ridiculously handsome man. I can't write to everyone. But please know that I consider you my dearest and closest internet friends. I'll never forget this time we spent together. I love you, always. Silverfish head catch! We included that to show. You always have to go out with a bang. The end of that campaign was highly watched. It got more views um, than primetime television. Uh, Nielsen ratings report for primetime television views because that many people have now engaged with this and we're seeing these YouTube spots which are high production val quality but it's YouTube it's an easy platform to get your message out and to gather a big audience and once the customers feel like they're part of your brand and they're participative with it they'll get creative now uh, this was created by some um, fans for lack of a better word, a man named Nelson Abalos Jr. Uh, built the Old Spice voicemail generator. So this is user-generated content that when you went to it, you could fill out the form, put in your phone number, and click a few options, and you would make your own Old Spice voicemail, which could be uploaded to your phone, and you would have the Old Spice guy handling your incoming messages with your friends. Man you're calling can't come to the phone right now because they're that's what their man mind said and they'll return your call as soon as possible. Do, 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 do. That's what we were waiting for. Um, so again it's a chance for your customers to feel like they're part of your brand, to truly participate to the next level. And if you create those kinds of connections with them and let them play in your sandbox a little bit, it's surprising what customers come up with on their own. Let me show you one more case study, um, and then I'm looking at my clock. I, I may have to jump to my concluding slides, because I've talked more than I thought I would. Um, but this is Vitamin Water doing very much the same thing with their campaign called Make Boring Brilliant. The idea was to really show that they understand who their customer is, and that there's a unique culture they're trying to appeal to. <laughs> Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? When Lars Brooks and I is on a game for the basketball team, it's an honest, hard-working man trying to make a living. I'm not here to beg, ladies and gentlemen. Things are actually going pretty well for me right now. I used to live in a two-bedroom apartment in a great neighborhood until my family was forced to move because we wanted more space. We recently bought a house in the suburbs with a pool and a yard in which our dog could run around and play. They 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is my daughter. She was recently accepted to an Ivy League school. The tuition is very, very expensive. My wife and I were unsure how we would ever be able to afford it until the university gave her a full scholarship. So be pretty hype about that. She'll probably be a doctor someday. I used to have a great job at a financial institution, but now I have an even better job at that same financial institution. I got a promotion. I made my vote. I'm not sure. My family and I just came back from vacation. We were at the Grand Canyon. If anyone has a chance to go to the Grand Canyon, I highly recommend it. The views are truly breathtaking. This cup in my hand is not for change. I have plenty of my own. This is simply because I finished my latte and I refuse to litter. With everything going well, all I really need for y'all is some congratulations, a high five. Thank you, brother. They owe us a strong handshake. He really needs it. Thank you. Thank you, our cop. Thank you. Providing entertainment to your customers, you're also meeting some of those addictive qualities that they want to feel uh, uh, that risk-reward cycle, which is such a powerful part of creating a, a chemical dependence. It comes very powerfully from providing a source of entertainment. Uh, vitamin water ties this back to their brand because they made something boring like water <laughs> much more exciting or brilliant, and now they've taken these simple mundane experiences like a subway ride and the common scenario of someone asking you for change on the subway into something that I think is pretty entertaining and worth watching again. Hopefully that video showed clearly. If not, you, you've got to find that one. It's fun. Let's do one more video and People it's going to say bored. So bored they say what I just told five you. million times a week. And all that boredom had gone unanswered until a vitamin water decided to make boring brilliant. From the brand that shook up the beverage industry came an integrated platform that turned Twitter into a boredom emergency hotline. Now, when tweets called out boring waiting rooms, vitamin water brought in a full contact game of duck duck goose. Duck. Um, to step on, on, on top of that, Vitamin Water has also invited their consumers to interact directly with their brand in product production. They've run the contest several times where you could nominate flavors. Doritos done the same thing. If there are aspects of your brand where you've got in-house product development teams banging their head against a wall for an idea, it's that opportunity to reach out and crowdsource. Uh, an effective method for this is to just post it on your Facebook wall or on, on your Twitter posts and ask people to participate and incentivize it in the format of a contest. Um, here's one that was run by Vitamin Water. So you saw in that, their initial contest, they had over 1 million participants. And the takeaway to their case study is that because those 1 million people felt like they were part of the brand's creation process, they helped develop that new product, they felt loyalty to the brand, and a lot of them went out and were going to buy that new flavor. Uh, that's just a given. When bands get involved with your company, they feel that sense of ownership. Um, and they'll jump back on and communicate with your brand. The key thing here is if you're giving the customer the ownership, you also need to provide the platforms for them to communicate and create that dialogue, that two-way communication with your company. And it's important to be present 
and responding uh, in, in real time in the, on those social media platforms where customers have now been trained. Um, you know, social media is not new. Customers are now used to using that as both an engagement tool and as a customer service method. Let's show one more example of a, a client we've worked with uh, locally. This is a uh, internet service provider out of Provo called Veracity Networks. And we simply asked them what they stood for. And their unique selling proposition summed up in three words was, we're fast, we're reliable, and we're deadly. Uh, we took that and we said, you know what, that also defines, that is a perfect description for ninjas. Um, <laughs> so we took the ninja idea and we really pushed it through all of their branding. Uh, you can see that ninjas were also a popular meme or um, internet topic at the time that we played this. And um, they've moved on since ninjas to pirates and I think unicorns. But at the time we were playing with a, a strong theme and we were able to incorporate this ninja idea which really tied back to Veracity's core values which were we're fast, we're silent, we get the job done for you um, in a reliable way. And they um, changed their packages, you know, rather than a gold, silver, and platinum uh, package deal, you could buy uh, Ninja Assassin, Sensei, and Grandmaster, I think were the tiers of product offerings that tied back into their, to their Ninja themes. And once fans hear these things, it gives them something to play with. They understand where your company's coming from, and they can jump on, and, and when they play along with your brand, you're creating high levels of interaction that create engagement that again feed that risk reward loop and really create a bond with that customer where they feel if I go here and I post, they'll post back. And getting that chance to share their personal information and having a conversation with even a, a, a faceless corporate entity, for lack of a better term, um, really resonates with us psychologically as human beings and it makes us feel valued and appreciated. So a contest we ran for them was what goes fast, and we invited their fans to post photos on their wall of things going fast. And we saw you know, several posts of ninja-themed ideas until we even got to the point where when people saw ninja memes, ninja images, or took ninja photos, they would come back and share it with veracity. They thought, when I think of ninjas, I think of veracity, which any marketer will tell you is great brand association. Um, I'm going to jump ahead and hit my wrap-up slide. Um, I really wanted to talk about basically creating a strong call to action in every post, which is inviting your reader to engage or participate with that post so they understand, again, how you want to talk to them, how they should use your Facebook page or your Google Plus page or see those same messages delivered to them on Twitter, but it creates a uniform and consistent brand message so that your brand's personality is conveyed to your customer and they feel like they're getting to know you better the more they engage with you, be it on your website, email correspondence, package deliveries, or of course on your social media platforms. That synergistic point of view really creates that loyalty bond because you feel connected to a company. Um, that is the point that I said I would skip. So let me grab my closing slide, which is here. Um, marketing using the seventh legal addiction is really our interesting point of view of approaching creating customers who are emotionally connected. Uh, these are the stats that I delivered in my opening slide, which is that an emotionally connected customer will be 300% more likely to recommend you to their friends. Better yet, they are 44% less likely to shop around and it will be 33% less sensitive when it comes to your price. Uh, that was for a consultant to Amazon.com, Neil Patel, who's built and sold several other companies. Um, we believe those are hard metrics that we can deliver on. And it really is stimulated by customers who feel that they are an active part of your company and that you're listening to them. And that type of risk reward is going to stimulate that cyclical behavior of wanting to engage more with your brand and become an advocate of that brand. That concludes the presentation portion <laughs> of, of the webinar. Awesome. Sean, thanks. Um, that was good stuff. I, some of the data you had was fascinating. Like, the, the thing that's staggering to me is the, the loyalty um, that customers have with you when they feel like 
they're connected with you emotionally or when they feel like they're sort of a part of what you're doing. It seems like kind of what you're saying. So um, let's open it up for questions now, everybody. We've got about 10, 15 minutes left. If you have questions, type those into the little question bar and go to webinar, and I'll read those to Sean. So just go ahead and write those questions in now, um, and we'll, we'll get started. So, Sean, here's a couple of questions for you. In terms of getting customers addicted to your brand, if you will, like you said, I think you know, you've got to engage them, you've got to pull them in. If you could highlight one specific tactic that a business could do right now or tomorrow or something quick to, to really connect with the customers more, because that's really what you're talking about, what would that tactic be? What would that one thing be? It's never as easy as all that. It's a great question. We address it on a daily basis. But it really becomes going back to the drawing board of figuring out what your company is about. In that example with Veracity, we said, give us three words that describe your unique selling proposition. What we see with customers today is they're really looking for something that's more aspirational. So you simply selling a product or a service isn't creating a community. It isn't creating an addiction because people don't know what need you're satisfying. So unfortunately, the hardest answer to that question is figure out what you offer that's unique and distinctive for your brand, but is also something you can build an entire community around. I know, that's easier said than done. <laughs> so let me give you a, a quick example of that. When people get to a website, they don't necessarily know what they're supposed to do there. And what you want to do is show them a very quick button, a play button, a click here, a register here, a sign up on this e for this email newsletter. You want to give them very clear breadcrumbs of where you want them to go. That's the same way you want them to feel about your brand, that if they can walk away and say, I understand this brand very well because they are the place where I go for you know low quality high or low cost high speed internet um, just to keep using the veracity example then you've already created a, an idea that people can get their heads around people love being able to say this is what this brand stands for um, now to give you the example of that the first thing we do usually with a, a Facebook page once we have a considerable audience um, more than a couple of hundred people, <laughs> we want to show them exactly how to engage with that page. And so we'll run an incentivized promotion where we say, post your testimonial, or you saw that one where it said, post photos of ninjas on our page, and we'll offer you a prize. And the prize could be free service for a month, discounted products. It could be something unrelated. We've done gift cards and vacations and iPads to death um, with the idea that once you've trained your audience for a period of 18, 15, um, sorry, 15 to 20 days, then they understand how they're going to engage with your page. Very interesting. So what about people who are in industries where, um, you know, maybe somebody's, I'm trying to think of a local business, um, somebody's, a, they own an auto repair shop, so they're a small business. You know, I can I can hear people saying, "Gosh, how do I create an emotional connection with a, a business like that with my customer?" Um, any suggestions for local type businesses who who say, "Look, what I do is not terribly thrilling," um, to to really get customers to buy into what you're doing and to feel connected with you? Um, the quickest answer to that, and again, it's a great question, and we address it on on a weekly, if not daily, basis, is Find something that connects to your brand and build a community around that. Does that mean you, you know, if you're a small auto shop that you don't have a, a strong community tie? It, it, the, the, I'll, I'll just give you an example we've used. We had a client approach us a while ago and they said, what is it, you know, that we can do that would really reach out to our audience and make them feel like we're not just trying to sell them tires or lift kits or body kits for cars? or whatever, and we ask them a few of those key questions that go back to Marketing 101. Who's your target audience in your 80-20 rule? Who's delivering the majority of your revenue? And one of the insights we revealed for that company was they sold, they made a lot of money and sold a lot of lift kits and car kits, aftermarket car kits, to high school kids. And so we said, use your page to serve that function. And we created a community page for them that was targeted at the local high school football team right there in their neighborhood, which was a block or two away from them. And that was where they became, began, they would attend the high school football games and other sports events, and they would grab scores, 
and photos and video clips and start putting them on there just the way that the local newspaper used to highlight their local team. And by sticking that stuff on their Facebook page, they made their page the community for local high school football. Then people were coming to their page with an understanding of this tire company cares about our local team, which is a, is a great message if you again if you're that if you're that marker targeted, and then it was easy for them to occasionally throw in messages like, hey, it's game day, we're running a discount on tire rotations. You know, suddenly you have a reason to be pushing your products and a certain angle you're pushing um, your your product messages rather than just using it as a broadcast page or the way most people use a Facebook page, which is to offer discounts and coupons. Interesting. So the, what you're saying is it doesn't necessarily need to be a part of or related to the type of product or service they're selling. It's just being involved more and, and having uh, people view you as supportive of, of events and things like that. That's, that's interesting. Um, well stated. Okay, I would say it should tie go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Sean. I, I, it would should tie into your product at some point, but it doesn't necessarily need to be. We do auto repair. We sell yeah. burritos. I mean, that should be become almost a secondary point that's understood in the community to give people a reason to join the community and talk about something they're all interested in. Very interesting. And then the last thing is you mentioned right off the bat um, a statistic. I think it was maybe in that Harvard study you cited that talked about how. People like sharing information about themselves. It actually like brings them a pleasurable feeling. Um, how can companies how can companies take advantage of that? Like, how can they maybe do that or get their clients to do that? Any suggestions on that? That's kind of off the beaten path from what you were talking about generally, but it seems like that's an important way if it's something that's so powerful to the to the brain, if you will, to get people engaged with you. It's actually easier than it sounds. McKay, the answer to that is being responsive. It's mm -hmm. going, it's letting people talk on your page and giving them an answer. It's, it's sad how many times clients have shown us their work on, on social media sites where they're obviously investing time, energy, budget to build a social media following and they'll have a customer co comment, a concern, even a positive thing like a testimonial that goes unanswered. When a customer, I, I mentioned it before, that if a customer puts themselves out there, they're doing that because they've been trained. Through behavioral cues, they've been trained that I can go and write on a Facebook page of a company, and that, bit, that company will listen to me. And that's a different outlet now in the mind of the consumer. They're not picking up the phone dialing 1-800 numbers. It's another outlet for them to reach out to a company. If they get crickets back, we're still, professors, scientists are working on this. They're still trying to find a metric for the detriment that can be to your brand to have an unanswered post from a single customer because that customer sees it. Uh, and the old cliche is you, you please a customer, they tell three people. You upset a customer, they tell 30,000. This is happening in an even, even more dramatic way on social media because that customer can then say on their own wall to their friends, you know what, they don't respond, they don't take care of me. Um, I shouldn't give terrible examples, but we worked for a restaurant for a while where their customer service was horrible and we tried to filter it through Facebook that a company eventually went out of business not because they're food wasn't great and their entertainment was spectacular. The only thing like it in Utah, <laughs> I may be giving away too many clues to who this was, but there was something like it in Colorado but nothing else like it in Utah. Um, but it was really their customer service that damaged them so much because customers felt like they were engaging with their, their, this restaurant and with their brand but they weren't getting any reciprocity. They were not getting anything back in return which is the same if you think about a relationship you've been in. If you're giving and putting stuff out there and you're getting back silence, you, you resent that company. It becomes a very personal thing. And that's a key takeaway that's a whole nother webinar in itself is the boundaries are tra changing for companies. Companies no longer treat customers like an arm's length client. You see more and more of we're your friend, we're your neighbor. Like a good neighbor is a popular theme that's appearing on several different advertising campaigns and you treat your neighbor differently than you treat a customer. If I'm your neighbor, you're not going to hit me with a late fee. If I'm your neighbor and I need something from you, a 24-hour service, I expect you to answer the phone and not give me a machine. So when we're adjusting these business relationships over to people relationships, which is very impact, very visible on social media, people expect you to behave like a person, even if you're a, a corporate logo on the top of your Facebook page. That's great. 
Well, thank you for taking the time. We appreciate it. And everybody, thank you for attending today. I um, hope it was worth your time. I think it was. Watch for the email from us tomorrow morning that will have the recording attached to it. Uh, next week we have uh, a couple of really, I think, interesting webinars for you. If you go to logmycalls.com, you'll be able to see logmycalls.com slash webinar. Um, we're actually going to do an overview of conversation analytics, um, which is our new new tool. Generally, we don't do like feature things in our webinars, but we decided to, uh, to talk a little bit about it uh, next week. So thanks for the time, everybody. Hope you have a wonderful day. And, and Sean, thanks for taking the time, sir. We appreciate it. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.